Without further ado, I'll hand over the stage to, uh, to Lee and John. Can I get a warm applause and a big yell for uh, both of them? Thank you. Ah, boy band. Lot, this is a lot different than last year. <laughs> yes. So. You going to kick off? Yeah, I'll kick off. Hey, guys. Lee Ditankian. Um, it's kind of funny because this is director of product management. That's a bit outdated now because I think last week, uh, running engineering, supposedly, I think NVIDIA is taking off with everything. So they gave me more responsibility as of last week. And here's my colleague. Hey, I'm John, um, Vertisant CTO. Um, so at Vertisant, we work with um, all sorts of organizations, helping them with all aspects of the cloud. Um, obviously, FinOps being a big part of that, um, working with sort of many billions of cloud spend and helping people to make sure they're using that efficiently. Cool, and just a little about me, guys. Like, it's kind of interesting, like, my career. I think I've been working, like, old, so, like, 25 years. Like, the first part of my career was, like, I was an investment banker, so kind of ironically, I don't know how I got into software engineering, but I was recruited at Apple to do something totally different. I was building financial systems, then basically they moved me out to California, and I got stuck there, and they said, like, we need to figure out something else to do. So they made me help out and start running, like, a lot of the online store. So basically my role is like platform, infrastructure, and then tooling for like basically an online store. And like you could imagine from like 2011 to 2015, is when people used to wait like days to get an iPhone. So that was my responsibility, not to mess up the store. I think the short little story is like, it was a, probably some people in Apple, because I see a lot of my colleagues that we used to all work with, like the store couldn't take orders for like two days. And then like, Tim was calling like everyone in our group, like, hey, what's happening, stuff like that. So that's when a bunch of us stepped in and like, we scaled out the store to X amount of orders per second. So my job is to make sure every year that we could sell iPhones on this date and not mess it up. So I, I think like Alex, Glenn, and stuff like that, then you know, I went over to IBM. Um, they hired me at the same role at Apple again to do something for, because back then we always could do in the data center. Then they had the same problem with the cloud. Then, you know, did that, saved a bunch of money, did a bunch of other things, then went to IBM. Then now I'm kind of doing like the fourth time at NVIDIA, same thing that we kind of did over my career, but it's basically infrastructure optimization and stuff like that. So that's a little about me. I think some of the topics we'll cover today, John's probably going to, he's my mathematician buddy, because I, <laughs> I, I guess I could do math, but not as well as him. But we're going to cover like topics like ROI, efficiency, and stuff like that. Then like. He's gonna provide you like the examples and I'll provide like the context of what we did in my career and stuff like that over the course of time. And please, I know this session is, like this doesn't stop here. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn and stuff like that and I can walk you through like many of the things that we did and some of the learnings that we had. So please don't make the session like the last time or the Q&A, you can always reach out. Okay, John, take it away. Cool, thank you, Lee. Um, so yeah, how do you know if your FinOps program is effective? Um, can you justify that? Can you put numbers to it? Can you convince somebody to invest more next year? And I mean, I think a lot of people don't know that answer. I'm sure some in the room have got a good story on that. There are others probably thinking, yeah, you know what? Not sure quite how I'd do that. Um, and what we've seen is there are some cases where people have maybe spent millions on tools. They've got a team with loads of headcount. Cloud bill's still going up, and everybody's sort of asking, well, you're actually achieving anything? You're investing all this money, but doesn't really seem to be doing a lot. On the other end of the scale, there's people maybe kind of unsung heroes, grassroots, achieve loads of good stuff, but don't know how to tell their story. Nobody actually knows the value that they're bringing to the business and how they're contributing. Um, and so what we're looking at here really is how do you figure out a simple measure you can use to tell how well you're doing in your FinOps program? Um, the way people tend to tackle this, the most obvious is, well, what's happening to the bill? If it's going down, that's good news, isn't it? Of course, that's not the whole story. Your bill might be going up, but you might be doing more business. Maybe your bill's going up sort of 50%, you're doing twice as much business. Actually, you're probably winning there. Um, so just looking at the bill isn't sufficient. Um, people look at things like RI coverage, and that's great. That's an important part of what you're doing. You're effectively there, you're saying, am I paying the lowest cost I can for each thing that I use? And that's very important. A lot of great sessions on that. Um, but it's not the entire story. 
because what if you're using a load of stuff that you don't even need to be using? Whether I'm paying 10 cents for it or 20 cents, if I don't actually need to be using it, then, well, let's just stop using it. Um, and I guess the kind of the, the nirvana, if you like, in this space is unit economics. And again, I think there's a chalk talk in a couple of hours on this. Um, more advanced topic, it's where everybody, I think, would like to get to. You actually really tie into business measures. How much does it cost me per iPhone sold or per, per widget produced? Um, but that does tend to be quite a bar to get there. You need to have those metrics. You need to figure out what they are. You need to get them into your systems. You need to compute with them. So they're, they're fairly complex to do. Um, and so what we're looking for is a measure that kind of is simple, but which doesn't have some of the drawbacks here. And that's what we term cloud efficiency. Um, now, to understand what that means, um, let's think about a different problem domain. And efficiency is a word that we kind of know from all over the place. Um, lots of different things or try and sell your products based on how efficient they are or whatever. So if we think about cars, so I mean, at the simplest, efficiency is just the ratio of the useful output you get to what you put in. Um, so a car, you've got your fuel going in on the left-hand side there. Uh, left-hand side, I guess it's that side, isn't it? Um, the engine's doing something. Hopefully, you're getting some movement, some useful work. But there's also a load of waste, a load of heat, and other kinds of things. And so what we're doing is looking at, OK, how much useful work, movement, am I getting for the fuel I've put in? Um, now, I guess let's see if people have an idea of roughly where efficiency is on cars. So who, who in the room, put your hand up if you think that a typical internal combustion engine, so a standard petrol gas car, is, I don't know, let's say more than 5% efficient. Anyone? Okay, so I think, let me try another thing. Put your hand up if you hate audience participation. <laughs> okay, um, well, let's try, we had a few at five. Let's try 10, more than 20, more than 30, 50. Anyone think that car engines are 100% efficient? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that worked well, didn't it? So, um, so let's have a look. The answer is um, typical modern internal combustion engine, somewhere around about 20% efficient. And the key from that really is it's not 100. Um, we'll see how this relates to the cloud and to FinOps in a minute. But efficiency isn't something where you're ever going to get to 100%. It's an objective measure. You can use it to compare. So for example, here, Ford Model T on the left there, maybe, I don't know, was 5% up to modern cars, 20%. So we can see how, over time, efficiency changes. And we can maybe compare different models. Maybe the Toyota there is, I don't know, let's say 18%, and there's some Ford that's 20%. So we can compare different things. Um, and then the interesting one on the right here, you change technology completely, you can get a step change. There's only so far you can take an internal combustion engine and squeeze more out of it. At some point, you're going to reach a limit, but then you can make a step change, and you can get up to about 90% on EVs. And the reason we're talking about this is you can probably see the obvious parallels within the FinOps world. I want a measure that lets me see how I'm doing over time. This year, I'm this much better than I was last year. I want to be able to compare different things, this team compared to this team. And I also want to be able to see if I invest in making a more significant change, am I going to get a good benefit? So for example, maybe on the left, I've got a, a simple app that I lift and shifted from a data center. On the right, I've made a step change. I've re-architected. I've gone to Kubernetes. I've gone serverless or something. Um, and by making those bigger investments and those changes, you can make those, those big jumps. Um, so that's enough about cars. So what does it mean in the FinOps world? Um, as I say, a lot of parallels there. Um, so over to Lee to. Yeah, I think John berated cars enough, so I'll walk you through how this applies to your FinOps program. I think a lot of it, like if I look at like cloud efficiency, you know, you have your usage and waste, but like even how it applies to me, like when just like we'll take a normal simple example, like back to something related to like a cloud provider, like if you have 100 terabytes of storage that you purchase, you know, and you know, that's probably like a less example, but simple math. You guys probably use a lot more than that or purchase a lot more of that for the whole year. Then you, you only use or store about like 40 terabytes of it, for example, right? So in that way, the waste is like 60 unused. So like, that's totally messed up. 
then you have 40% efficiency. Like, there's sometimes I wish I had that number, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but again, that's just a simple benchmark that we would measure. But the overall thing that we're looking at, when, when I did this in numerous iterations, like, like it's kind of weird because we were kind of doing FinOps like in 2000, like 10 and nine, but it wasn't called there because I guess Jira hasn't invented it yet. But, <laughs> but in that, like, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is figure out like, how much could we optimize like a data center or rack for like, and I think you also have to understand like efficiency with like the value that you get. So I think that's like, it's a double-edged thing. Like my buddy Rick Ox is here, you see like show like a coin like with performance and then cost. But in this model, you always have to look at two sides of the thing, like value and then efficiency. So you could save tons of money. Like you probably, I, if you hired me today, I could probably tell you if you had a $100 million bill, how to shave off like 60 million really quick. But the thing is like, at what value are you costing your organization? What value does you want? Like the first iteration when I did this for my measurement was around like, hey, I wanted to spend this much, optimize this much, but we wanted to get this many orders per second. So then that unit that was in a rack in a data center, if we had like 50 racks, I knew how much I had to buy and stuff like that, then work with all the contracts and negotiations and build out a data center now. In the, when it flipped over the cloud, you know, we're trying to save, like, I remember me and Gabe, Gabe works with me now at NVIDIA. Like, um, he, he, he was always, I always told him, like, we build these plans, and he convinces the engineers to do it, because I was probably too scared to tell him, but he's the one that got it figured out. But, like, in the cloud, it was a little bit different. We had to figure out how much we could save, then, like, work with the engineers to get a piece of it, but also get enough data across, like, the whole, platform and ecosystem to understand like CPU memory and everything for every single service, everything that touched each other and stuff like that. And then we figured out how much we could save, how much we could work with, how much a, how much a team could do this. And that's the big thing. Like we always looked at like the value and context we provide. So even at NVIDIA today, I think the big thing we're trying to figure out too is like as we're trying to optimize all this infrastructure that we sell or we co-sell with the CSPs, it's like, at the end of the day, the, the value is like how many workloads could someone run or like jobs and that's the always thing. Like Gabe would say, hey, I found a new algorithm to do this. I'm like, but I didn't go back. What's the value back to the business that we're getting? So it's just the context to remember like as you get efficiency, you also understand and question sometimes like what's the value your organization's getting? There's always some trade-off. And I think that's a big thing is like as I've been going through my career this way, it's just something to remember and like challenge yourself at a, always at a point in time. I'll let John go back to more math because he likes that stuff. <laughs> so you can go from there. So Thank you. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll come back in a minute to the how you balance the kind of the, the benefits you're getting with what it's spending as we look at ROI and kind of on, on the road to that. Um, how in the world of FinOps do we work out efficiency? Um, so let's take a, a simplified example of compute. So let's say we're spending a thousand bucks on VMs. Um, we're doing some work and some amount of that is useful, some amount is the VM sitting doing nothing or, or at least not being pushed to its limits. Um, so the thousand bucks, what's it bias? Well, let's, let's keep it simple. Let's say $800 of that is on CPU, 200 is on RAM. Obviously, if you want to go to town, you can begin to try and figure out, well, how much did I spend that was network and how much was, if it's GPU machine, GPU and whatever else. Um, but we'll keep it with just the two. Um, how do I work out how much I've actually used. I've, I've paid for a CPU that for the entire hour or the entire day, I could be maxing out if I had a workload that really wanted to do that. Well, if I just look at the average, that's how much I'm actually using. Um, so let's say it was 11% CPU, 30% RAM. Um, so I can obviously get those from sort of standard metrics, um, pretty easy to do. Um, so the value of CPU I've used, 11% of my 800, so I've used $88 worth of CPU. Similar for RAM, I've used $60. So if I add those together, for my $1,000, I've got $148 worth that I've actually used. And again, like with our car example, it's important to realize 100% isn't the target here. We're not saying you can get to a point where you magic up a VM and it costs you exactly $148 and it's a perfect fit. That, that's not gonna happen, you're not gonna get 100% efficiency. But what you tend to find is as you get more advanced in your optimizations, you can get closer. So maybe simple right sizing, yeah, I can probably get to, let's say 30% efficiency. 
Um, but you know what, there are going to be maxes, and I've got to allow for those because my application is sort of latency sensitive, and so I'm never going to be able to put it right on the average. So if I write size, I might get 30. If I begin to consolidate and do Kubernetes and things, maybe I can get it higher. If I go serverless, then maybe I get higher still, but again, never going to get to 100%. That's not what this measure is about. Um, so that's, that's a simple example. As I say, you can sort of go to town on different resource types and different elements and costs, but that's the, the basic idea is kind of what are the main things you're paying for? How do I measure how much of them I'm using? Yeah, and then a bit, you know, a big thing on the slide is like how to use cloud efficiency in your FinOps program, but overall efficiency. I think when you look at like the efficiency itself, like you, if you could justify the value and stuff like that, you're gonna, you know, we'll talk about investment and stuff, but at the end of the day, at any point in program, like let's not talk about like FinOps or efficiency, but like, like when my niece was like training, but she was like a track star in high school, like you got to remember, like since she was like ten. Every time she ran or every pace she was like measured or everything, like, you know, everything is all about data at the end of the day. And like how the measurement, she's on the stopwatch. Like if she put her arm this way, like it could slow her down. So stuff like that, like you could apply those same like principles, like just on your normal day of life, like how you look at efficiency, then how does it work in your FinOps program? And then, you know, you want to get to some value or outcome or output. Like, you know, for my niece again, she was trying trying to get faster to like win state and those things. In your FinOps program too, it's like you're trying to get efficient because of why and like what value you're trying to unlock. A lot of this, like, you know, as we're trying to solve it today at, over at NVIDIA, it's like I want, you know, no surprise or anything, we want people to buy these expensive GPU boxes and get the most out of them, right? Like for me, it's like I have to figure out if someone's gonna pay X amount, and you could say like 100,000. I think a GPU on eBay goes for like 50,000 these days. Like, but if someone buys that, like, I want them to get the most value out of it, to run the most jobs, to run the most workloads. So at the end of the day, it comes like to an experiment of like how you're getting value out of this stuff and then like what you're doing. You could always say, like I said, you could always save money, but like the business context and the value is what we're always challenging to look at, when, me and my teams as we run this stuff. I think John's gonna go more in that than we'll talk about ROI in a second. Cool, thanks, Lee. Um, yeah, and I would also mention in terms of using efficiency. Um, an example of us, and we've got a, a large client who this year has actually put an efficiency target as part of the discretionary bonus criteria for their engineering teams. So it can be a great way to sort of really focus people in on what you're trying to achieve. Um, I kind of feel like at this stage with this unlikely boy band with our white chairs, like I should try and kind of stand up for the hook or something, but... Um, I'll stay seated. Um, so yeah, let's do some maths. And, and by the way, story here, I, I managed to persuade Dean, who's hiding at the back somewhere and who put the slides together for us, to, to go with the English version rather than the American version. So we're doing some maths, not some math here. Um, so yeah, let's say, and we've got, got a couple of things going on here, but I think it's important to, to show how efficiency works better than, for example, just looking at the bill. So let's say in the year, our efficiency went up from 15% to 18%. Um, in the same period, our bill went up from 100 to 105 million. Now, on the face of it, maybe somebody's shouting, the bill's gone up, you haven't got it under control, whatever. But what, what's really going on here? We know we've made some improvement, but we know our bill's higher. Are, are we winning? Are we losing? And so a simple way we can figure that out is basically to figure out what would it be costing us if we'd not done all that great work in FinOps. So, we were paying 100 million at 15%, so we were getting 15 million of useful value. We were getting 15 million out the right-hand side of those boxes and arrows we had. So now we're paying 105 million, and we're getting 19, sorry, oh yeah, 19 million, yeah, 18% of 105, 19 million out of it. Now, if we hadn't made the improvement, what would it have cost us to get 19 million of value? And if you remember high school maths, you can just kind of swap the equation around. So if I take, value and divide it by efficiency. So 19 million of value, if we were still on 15%, well, that would have actually cost me 127 million. So if I'd not had the efficiency improvement, my bill would now be 127 million. It's only 105 million, so 22 million. So that's, that's been the dollar benefit. That's, if we'd not done this FinOps program, if we'd not improved efficiency, that's where we'd be. Um, so that kind of gives you a way to turn the efficiency change into an actual money value.
and you know, overall, like the big thing out of this slide is like you want to understand like the return on investment. You know, John laid it out in that, but you guys are all running your FinOps programs or starting them out or in this thing. At the end of the day, someone's going to ask like, hey, what's the ROI that I'm getting? You guys are hiring the staff. You guys are doing these things. You're saving this money. I just want you guys to remember as we go through this, like you know, as we've been re reiterating, it's like as you measure the effectiveness and like things of your program and like whatever KPIs you run, the big thing you have to understand is like um, what what's the thing you're providing to organization? I can tell you like at Apple, it was like, hey, we, we did this, we got this many orders per second, we saved this much money, new businesses or reallocation of resources could come. Uh, at NVIDIA, I wish I could explain it more, but like it's like if, if I optimize these things, at the end of the day, the customers will buy, will, will be able to run more workloads really fast, and it's a, there's a new industry that may pop out in the next two years. So like, I'm really, like, as I'm running like, these engineering product teams, I'm really aware of like, the value that I'm providing. Because like, I see Jensen like, every week, and he's gonna ask me, like, hey, you saved all this money, so what? You know, then I have to give him a proper response. And you know, sometimes I could give him more and fuzzies, like, hey, we're doing this, but like, you know, I tell my teams, like, give me the data so we can actually look at the data to figure out what to optimize and why to optimize. And if it doesn't make sense to us, if I can't put it on a spreadsheet and do mats like him, then it doesn't really make sense to like the normal, like normal individual or even executive, because I have probably like 10 seconds to a minute to make sure he understands this with like all the other things that he has on his mind. So like, it's constantly always challenging, like what's the effectiveness of what we're doing and like the return on investment. And one more big example to end the mathematician. Cool, yeah. so let's carry on with the abnormal stuff. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, carrying on our example. So um, we figured out, okay, the effect was 22 million. We would have been spending 22 million more. Now let's say the FinOps program, let's say we spent 2 million on headcount for a team. Um, we spent 5 million, let's say, on licenses of a tool. Um, so what was the ROI? And I mean, this, this varies. Different orgs have different ways they calculate ROI. So if you're doing it in your org, you might want to align with that. But at the simplest, um, if you kind of Google ROI, the, the most basic definition is what was the net return? So the amount we saved minus the cost of the program divided by what we invested, the cost of the program. So our net savings, 22 million minus the 7 million we spent. So net savings were 15 million. Um, divide that by the 7 million. So we got 15 million for investing 7 million. We got 214% ROI, which isn't a bad investment. And I think if I could go and make that, I'd go and make that investment. Um, so yeah, that gets you to an ROI. Great number that people obviously like to understand may well help sort of explain, okay, yeah, this, this is the value we've added. This is why we should continue to invest in this program. And with that, you'll be glad to know that's the last of the maths. Yeah, so the big thing, like, you know, we have, like, next seven minutes. Like, again, this Q&A doesn't have to stop here. So please, like, set, ask us a bunch of questions. And, again, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, and we can probably meet on Zoom. You can ask me a bunch of questions there, too. So, so this is a full-packed room, so that I cannot imagine there are no any questions. I'll run over there. First off, your modeling and approach is wonderful. How, how would you apply it to workloads that have yet to go in the cloud? Um, yeah, I mean, you can do the same in the data center. Um, it's a little trickier because, of course, you've got the fixed cost question. So whereas in the cloud, it's very much the, I can work out the cost of resource in the the data center where it's costing you, even if you're not using it, it's more variable. Um, but you can take a, a similar kind of approach. Um, fundamentally, the concept is simple. It's for every dollar, and in fact, somebody in one of the keynotes um, used this, um, I think it was Jennifer, as the, the quick summary, the one sentence of what's FinOps. It's how do I get the most benefit out of each dollar that I spend? So if you just use that as your basic premise, it can apply data center as well every dollar that I've got in the data center, how much of it am I actually making use of and how much is just sitting there doing nothing? Yeah, then the, the calculation that we did is we just took depreciation. I think, I think what CapEx is now like five years for some odd reason. It used to be three years. So you should just look at three years depth and just put like a baseline and say, this is how much we want to run the server till at like 85% and clock it. And we just watch it over three years and if we got that, then we're good, you know what I mean? Then if it, once it got wasted after you depreciate it, 
It's like, how much longer are we going to run that server for? You could run it. Sometimes if you're lucky, you could run it for 10 years, right? But you know, sometimes you're not. You could run it for years. So like, it depends how fast you're depreciating to when you could do that, then like, how much longer you're going to keep it life in existence. Right. Thanks, guys. Great presentation. I enjoyed the maths. Um, how do you synthesize that cloud efficiency number so neatly to like 18%? I think that's the part that any tips or tricks on that? Um, I mean, the first thing I'd say is don't try to be over precise. Directionally correct, comparative is what matters more than the absolute. So, yeah, in that example, we kind of looked at okay, I've got a certain amount of CPU I'm using and a certain amount of I'm not. Ditto for RAM. I could have gone to town on all kinds of other measures, but I kept it simple. And um, yeah, that, that's really the, the main thing is, is keep it simple. It can get trickier for other resource types. There are some where it's slightly less clear cut, but usually you can always find a way to figure out, well, yeah, how, how much of this am I really using and how much is kind of fat just sitting there not used. Yeah, then just to add to that, like it's good, like it's hard to compare like company to company, right? Like storage and compute, because like your engineers are not sometimes like the same engineers, right? And then the people are not the same people. So like it's always effective to take like a baseline across your organization and maybe split by like group or by like distinction of like, I don't know how everything's structured, but there has to be some category that you're doing it. Then compare the baselines in there. Then what you'll start seeing is like as each baseline, you could say this is category A, category B, category C. Like it's just good to see like what John was saying, directionally correct. You know, at some point things are gonna go up and things are gonna go to the top right, but you just have to make sure that each one's looked at differently. Then you manage accordingly to how your organization's built out. Cool. Other questions? Hi, hey, two questions. On one of your slides, you had progression, you know, you go to, where you end at serverless and maybe you hit 50%. Is that industry or your observation? Um, so that's based on our observations from uh, a large amount of cloud spend that we're working with with customers, so many, many billions of cloud spend. Okay. Uh, one more, thanks. Uh, if you're sitting on an instant size and you have a target utilization, so of say 70% CPU and 90% memory, do you just throw that into your maths on figuring out, you know, like, yeah, the, the cost times 70%, then figure out your average CPU and divide it all out? Um, yeah, I mean, you've got a choice there. I, I tend to prefer to keep efficiency to just be the pure number and to not worry about the 70%. But then when you're looking at your efficiency figure and figuring out, well, where could we get to, you take into account that we understand, we, we have a reason why we're never going to get this above 50% or whatever it may be, rather than trying to sort of factor those things in, try and keep the efficiency number sort of clean and change your targets to take that stuff into account. I mean, example, we a customer who their DR strategy is one region needs to have the capacity for another region to fail over into it, so effectively they're always carrying 100% headroom. So for them, we're kind of expecting, except in DR scenarios, that efficiency is, is going to be lower than it might be for a customer where the DL strategy is, is much more elastic. So yeah, it's kind of more about knowing what's the right target for your, your organization. And just, you guys understood why, like that's my buddy Glenn, like why like he was asking about serverless. So, like if I was a CSP, say if I was Amazon again, like the most abstraction you could get on like a server today would be serverless. You know, if you look at like over industry, like AWS first sold bare metal, then they sold you virtualization, and now they're selling you like EKS, Kubernetes, or EKS anywhere. And now they're sending you Lambda. Like, the whole objective is like, if I was a CSP, is like, how much could I run on that machine before it breaks, or how many people I could get in there? So at the end of the day, like, serverless is the f furthest abstraction to get the most people and get me the most margin. So essentially, you'll give, you, you, could, you, could, you could manage efficiency in a very dynamic way at that point. So. Thank you. Last question. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So just a one, just a one model what you put up, input, output, and waste, right, to track the efficiency. Uh, so actually that helped to uh, address, let's say, cost avoidance or means cost reduction, means how you will, because whenever the efficiency has to be in a three domain, right, cost avoidance, 
cost reduction or cost optimization. So can you explain that, how that model will work in all three scenarios uh, and how the maths will work? Yeah, I, mean, I think it, it does um, handle all of those because ultimately your, the key thing is that you're separating any, any fluctuations because of changes in transaction rates and the business from how well you're using your resources. So in, in the case of you're avoiding cost, that would be kind of like the example we had there, I guess, the um, efficiency improved. We've avoided this additional $22 million in our example. Um, so I think it, it pulls that out. Um, it, the other cases, I think, just do flow through similarly. Um, it's, it's kind of the, the measure in a way that is, is independent of that. It just gives you an objective way of, of saying, okay, this, this is, again, how much of every dollar that we're actually using and why, why you've got there, what you're going to do with that money you've saved. It's kind of, that's outside of that measure. Um, but ha happy to talk about that one uh, more afterwards if you'd like. Thanks for watching that session. I'm sitting here in San Diego right after FinOpsX. We hope you join us next year here live 2024. In the meantime, please subscribe to the channel and join the community. Get involved. Join the summits. Get in a working group. And don't forget to get FinOps certified. It's next year here in San Diego for FinOpsX. It's going to be twice as big. Come join the party. Come meet your people. Welcome home.